God, praise God, and happy, happy belated Easter. We've not met since uh, last week on Tuesday when we were doing Considering Jesus, and I hope you've enjoyed your Easter holiday. And I have enjoyed mine too. I intentionally made a decision that uh, within that time, I will study and scrutinize scriptures on matters to do with the life of Jesus because I was longing that God would revive the things that have died in my life over time. And uh, thanks be to God, I had a good time. Hope you also had a good time. Today, I'm back again on the Minister's Lounge. And today we are speaking about uh, serving God. I'm continuing with my series on serving God. And today I want to handle the topic, finding grace for service, finding grace for service. Bow your heads down from wherever you are and let's pray. Our God and our Father, I thank you. I bless you. In such hard moments, God, I pray that my heart and my viewers' hearts will be stirred up to serve you. That God, we will be encouraged, Jehovah Father, to keep on loving you, to keep on uh, using our gifts and our talents, dear God, for the purposes that you invested them in our lives. Thank you, God. I pray for my viewers that, God, you will strengthen them, that you will encourage them, dear God. For them that have gone through difficult times, Heavenly Father, may your spirit comfort them, Jehovah, in Jesus' name. And we say amen and amen. Finding grace for serving. And as I have said, celebrating the death and the resurrection of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ was an exciting thing because he died for a reason. He died that he may free us from the bondage of sins. Now, serving God in the midst of hard moments in our journey of faith is draining, challenging, and confusing unless we find grace to serve the Lord. The Bible says in the book of Psalms chapter number 137 and from verse number 1 that by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us captivity asked of us a song, and those who planted us requested a myth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. And they responded, saying, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We're looking at the children of Israel in a difficult time during their journey of faith to the land of their promise. And because of their sins, they find themselves at a particular point in Babylon. And uh, in Babylon, the ones that have carried them captivity were actually requiring a song from them. You know, songs that they used to use, sing freely, willingly, and with a lot of excitement. But now in Babylon, they are not able to sing those songs anymore. The Bible says they had hanged their harps. They could not want to sing God a song again. And most of us go through trying moments. We go through challenging moments. Particularly at this time during the pandemic since we all got into the pandemic season. And it has taken longer than we expected. We have been going through very hard moments. Moments that you feel like you don't want to go to church. Moments you feel like you don't even want to serve. Moments that you feel like you want to quit. Moments that you feel like, like the children of Israel, you just want to sit. You just want to be there. You just want to give up. You just want to surrender and just be there. And I am talking to us, and I know pastors, we have been able to discover that for us to be able to serve the Lord, for us who have continued with serving him, it has been truly a journey of pressing on. It's been a journey of pushing ourselves. It's been a journey of stirring ourselves up. It has not been easy. There are times you feel like you don't even want to do that stream. There are times you feel like you don't even want to go to that church. There are times you feel like you don't even want to call that member or encourage that member or start up someone. You don't want anything. It is hard moments or they are hard moments that paralyzes our morale to desire to do anything for God. Members have come back and the ones that have come back don't want to do anything again. 
They have lost a lot of virtue, spiritual virtue. The spiritual personal drive is gone. The challenges are real. The attack of the enemy is real. Most of us have lost our loved ones in the pandemic. Most of us have lost the energy to desire to do anything during this pandemic because it is so uncertain. You can't plan for the future. You can't invest. You can't do anything. And we are there. And I want to believe that uh, that one year most of us have gone through challenging moments and because of the protocols that have been instilled or have been put into place, it is even difficult to comfort one another with the social distancing. It is not clear how much do I offer ministry and particularly for us who come from an African culture where we really love a lot, you know, to hug. We like touching one another. But we are in a time whereby even you don't know how to mourn with the morning. You don't know how far you can go with them. Yesterday I was talking to a friend that I've been counseling from Nairobi who has lost two sisters in a week and she has lost them through COVID. And uh, she was not even able to travel for the burial. Uh, so she's not been able to even bring the whole issue to closure. And she can't even have people in her home to come and uh, comfort with her because she feels scared. She feels insecure. She feels it will be too much exposure. And you know, those things that we would do to one another, hugging one another, rubbing somebody's back so that we can be able to feel comforted. We are not able to do those things at this particular time. And the possibility, the possibility of us getting wounded is so high. The possibility of us getting bitter with one another, pastors getting bitter with the members, pastors getting bitter with the government and even lacking the balance of honoring the authorities that God has put over us, you know, to the extent of being so aggressive as men of God and women of God because of the bitterness and the resentment that has been cocked in our lives for the last one year. My friend, Yes, it is a difficult time. Pastors are wounded by their members. Members are wounded by their pastors because, again, no one was ever trained on how to pastor during a pandemic. So we are trying things that we have never done before. Some are working and some are not working. So in a difficult moment, the warmth of love of the brethren at times is very hard to be able to dispense in this kind of an environment yet you know what god expects us to serve him during this pandemic he expects us to honor him with our prayers he expects us to honor him in the studying of the word he expects us to grow spiritually in the midst of all that is happening because i want you to remember that it is god who has allowed all the things that we are seeing let us not be so much focused on the devil there is no way god would allow uh, the devil to exalt himself for a near and above no I believe that at the center of it all, God is involved in what is happening. God is involved in our everyday activity. God is involved in the deaths that are taking place. God is involved in the loss of our jobs. God is involved in everything that is happening. But how do we then serve God in the midst of challenges, in the midst of trials? Because I have said, most of us want to fold our hands. We want to sit. We Atutaki kusumbuliwa. Hautaki kusikia mtu akikwambia ufanye chochote. Because you are bitter. You went through so much. Nobody came through for you. Because it was a confusion for everyone with the uh, protocols required for us to be able to observe. Yet imagine God desires that we serve him during this time of the pandemic. He expects us to serve him during our hard moments. And that's why it is important to find grace to serve the Lord acceptably. Exodus chapter number eight and verse number one, the Bible says, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. In other words, uh, God delivered the children of Israel for the purposes of serving him. God desires that immediately we are born again. The next thing we engage in is serving the Lord. Ephesians chapter number two, verse number eight and up to 10. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Look at this. We've been created for good works. There are works that God would want us to do. There is the serving God, that God desires us to continue serving him. And it is for a purpose. Serving God is one of the most important principles of the Christian faith. As believers, we are expected to help the church with a joyful spirit, love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, help one another, counsel with one another, support one another in one way or the other. Our salvation has brought us to the family of God. And in this family of God, God expects us that if the body of God will be fully nourished, that me and you engage in the acts of service. First Peter 2 and verse number 4, the Bible says, Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and uh, precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. You know what? In the being built into a spiritual house, in the being established into a house of God, God expects that me and you will be able to engage in acts of service. God has made sure that none of us is independent. We are interdependent of one another. And there are things I cannot be able to do for myself. There are things you cannot be able to do for yourself. And God expects us to engage in the acts of service, you know, and he expects us to do it in the love of God and in the grace of God. And in this house, we are expected that each one of us may give their contributions to that house so that the full body of Jesus Christ is actually nourished. But most of us, when we go through a hard time, offended and wounded in the journey, we want a break. Pastors, you're familiar with this. Members come and say, this year, pastor, I want a break from the singing group. I want a break from the ushering. I want a break. I feel I am so exhausted. I want a break. You are not the only one. The children of Israel, when they found themselves in Babylon, they wanted a break from the work of God. They could not even want to sing a song. They are looking from afar and do not desire at all to get engaged in the work of God. It's a familiar feeling. Let me tell you, we as pastors go through the same, same familiar feeling. There are times you feel you don't want to preach. There are times you feel you don't want to come to church. There are times you feel like Moses felt in Numbers chapter number 11. And he's asking God, am I the one who gave birth to these people to hell with them? You know, I need a break from their murmuring. I need a break from their demands. I need a break. I cannot continue dealing with them. And I know we have felt the same. How do we serve God in the pandemic? How do we serve God when we have lost our loved ones? How do you serve God after burying your father, after burying your mother, after burying your own child, after losing a job? How do you serve God after contracting a virus? How do you serve God even when you do not have hope for tomorrow with all their uncertainty? How do you serve God? Imagine God is expecting us that in this environment, in this season, in this crisis, we may engage in acts of service. Actually, God desires that at this point of brokenness, at this point where people are so discouraged that we arise and serve God's people and be the light that will shine brighter and be the noise that will actually speak of the love of God without yelling and be the candle that will bring light in the dark situation 
and be the salt that will make this life taste better. Because let me tell you, this life has turned to be stale, staying in the house, living in fear, working without assured profits, waking up in the morning, going out without knowing how to come back in the evening. Yet, my dear friend, God expects us that we may serve him in an acceptable manner. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. We have been born again and are coming from a kingdom that is shaken and can be shaken and will continue to be shaken. But you know what? Uh, we've been transferred to the kingdom of his dear son. And uh, in this kingdom of God's dear son is a universal kingdom because we have three kingdoms. We have the uh, kingdom of God, that is the universal kingdom where God reigns and when God, where God rules and it's an everlasting kingdom. And we've been transferred in the kingdom of God uh, where God is our father. And this kingdom cannot be shaken. Then again, we have been called to go to another kingdom that is coming with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the kingdom that we will be receiving. And that kingdom again will not be shaken. And because we are coming from a kingdom that has been shaken, God is entreating us that we serve him with this understanding that his kingdom, his universal kingdom will not be shaken. So the things that we saw in this kingdom, the things that we do in this life when we are in God, they will count now and count in the future. They, are, they can never be lost because God has a book of remembrance. And then he's talking about a coming kingdom that we will be able to receive, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this other kingdom again is a kingdom that will not be shaken. Now he's saying when we get into this understanding that that which we invest with a heavenly focus in the kingdom of God cannot be shaken, cannot be lost. And our God is not just to forget our works. Then he's asking us, we need to make sure that though weak, though discouraged, though fainting, we need to find grace that we may continue serving God and do it acceptably and do it in reverence and do it with godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. In other words, what the Bible is saying, we need to understand that this world is a shakeable kingdom, but the one we are receiving is unshakable. And God promised the children of Israel through their father David that there was Jesus who was to come and he was the one who was to establish that kingdom. Now, because that kingdom will not be shaken, we need to be stirred up. We need to keep on getting encouraged in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our challenges, in the midst of our weaknesses. As much as we feel we want to hang our harps, we need to be stirred up to do the right thing because the kingdom that we are receiving is unshakable and the promises that God has promised for us who serve him will be rewarded in the coming kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. We therefore, number one, need to find grace in serving him. Romans 7 and verse number 6, the Bible says, But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, uh, so that we serve in a new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. They used to do it in the law. We need to do it from our spirit man. We need to do it from our heart. We need to do it from love. Remember what we said last time about a bond servant. As somebody who had totally been freed by someone who paid their debts. And uh, after serving those people for seven years, those people were totally free to go and live their own lives. You know what? But those people chose not to live, but to serve willingly and yielding 
uh, to their master because of the grace that had been shown towards them. Now, if we are going to serve by grace or if we are going to find grace for service, we need to consider the relationship of Jesus, of our God the Father with the children of Israel. Look at the patience that God has with these children. Look at the love that he has with his children. Look at how they behave in their first uh, generation after being delivered from the land of Egypt. Yet God visit them for a second time through their son or through his son or their elder brother Jesus Christ. Why? He was patient with them. He was long suffering with them. He was kind with them. He was compassionate to them. And when you consider how God has pursued the children of Israel, you can only have grace. You can only have patience to keep on serving the people of God in love without giving up on them. When we consider the love of God towards the Israelites and towards us, what we find is grace. Look at the love of God. He gave his only begotten son that me and you may not be able to pay the penalty of sin. When we consider God's sacrifice, when we consider his love, when we consider his compassion, when we consider the things that he has done for us, we can only find grace. We can only make it easy to serve God. We can only yield ourselves to be able to serve the Lord willingly. Then the other thing we need to consider is consider Jesus himself. Look at the son of God. The ones he, the ones he came to die for are the same people that are actually crucifying him. But he was willing, he was a willing sacrifice to lay down his life for them. Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 8, the Bible says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. He was willing. He was not looked for. Members, pastors, may the Lord help us to get stirred up. Let us not be pushed to serve God. Let us not be coerced during this time to be able to serve God. Our children want to hear the word of God being taught to them. Our mothers need encouragement. Our fathers need to be lifted up. Our men need to be taught the word of God. The youths need to be stirred up that as much as their school system or curriculum system has been shut down, all is not lost. They need to be encouraged by somebody. Let's arise in this time of pain and serve the Lord. Look at Jesus. He never gave up the service of God in the times of his affliction. You know, that though the ones that were afflicting him were the priests themselves. He had come to set a new order of priesthood that they were waiting for, but they did not understand that he was the son of God. And you can imagine, it is the priests that handed over the great high priest to the hands of Pilate. And you know, Pilate is saying, I have no wrong. I cannot see any evil with this man. And they say, you know what? He is purporting to be our king. And we have no other king apart from Caesar. Can you imagine the high priest rejected and resisted the great high priest and given an opportunity for them to be released to one person as it was the order of the day. The high priest, the man of God, the servants of God, the pastors of the people, the leaders of the people, they said, give us Barnabas to hell with this man. And could that be what is happening today where we have most of us men of God have really indulged uh, ourselves in the things of this world. We are indulging ourselves in the things of Caesar. We are indulging ourselves in the politics of this world. We are indulging ourselves like we are citizens in this land. You know what? The priest of the day misled the children of God in those particular days. I pray that God will help 
help me. I pray that God will help you. That instead of asking for Caesar, an earthly king, that we will direct the people of God to God himself. But look at Jesus. He never gave up to do that which God had sent him to do. He died. He ministered to them. He loved them. He forgave them on the cross and continued with his calling. It is your heart, the heart that serves, that count. Go to my YouTube channel and check on a message I did on Before You Serve. You need to pray. You need to honor God with your time. You need to surrender yourself and give yourself first as an acceptable sacrifice before the Lord. And then we need to serve him acceptably because God will not accept any kind of service. And we are not doing him a favor. He created the heavens and the earth on his own by his own word. He does not need us to do anything for him to accomplish his purposes in our lives and in the lives of the people. Hear me, man of God. Hear me, woman of God. God can bless his children without us. It's only a privilege. It's only an opportunity. We are just mediators before God and men, but he does not need us. He can meet them without having to meet us. You know what? I was reading a scripture in Judges chapter number three uh, that really stirred me up and and I ask God to help me and to forgive me at the same time. That God is saying in the book of Judges that he didn't finish some of the enemies because there were children that had not been taught spiritual warfare and God was testing their faith and he himself wanted to teach them on how to engage in battle. And you know what came to my mind is how we men of God have exalted ourselves on our power to deal with evil, our power to be a blessing to the lives of the people. Let me tell you, there is a great high priest and his name is Jesus Christ. When he chooses to bless his children, he doesn't have to bless the children of God through us. He can do it without us. Let's be humble. Let's do it within the measure that is accorded to us. We are just but vessels before the Lord. So if you're going to serve God, we need to serve God in an acceptable manner because our God is a consumer fire. We do not need to exalt ourselves beyond measure because there are things that God will not allow. And how do we serve God acceptably? In purity. We need to serve him in purity. Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 13, the Bible says, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremoniously unclean, sanctify them so that their bodies are clean. How much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself and blemish to God, purify our conscience from works of death so that we may serve the living God. We need to serve God from a pure spirit, from a purged spirit. We need to serve God in purity. We need to serve God in honesty. We need to serve God in cleanliness. If the blood of the bulls and the goats could be able to cleanse their bodies, how much more is the blood of Jesus Christ able to purify our conscience and, you know, get us from the works of death? But only if we are willing to separate ourselves from the works of death and from the works of the flesh, so that we can serve God in the spirit and do it in an acceptable manner. Matthew chapter number 23 and verse number 23, the Bible says, Wow, what to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. In other words, Jesus is telling the teachers of the law that purity and service go together. You cannot serve God and live in sin. And you know, we have been born again from the kingdom of darkness. We are coming from a kingdom of evil. We are coming, people who are used to exercise into dead works, 
Paul talking to the church of Corinthians where there was a lot of spiritual gifts that were functioning, yet they were living in sexual immorality. They were living in idolatry. They were living in fornication. They were living in evil, malice. The church was full of dead works. It was full of carnality. It was full of the things of this world. And that's the same thing that God would want us to be keen on. Where are you coming from? Before you lead us in worship service this Sunday, have you come from a girl's house? Are you living with a girl in your house? Are you the type that you're saying you cannot be able to do with, without sex and you're not married, yet you are the church worship leader? Come on, look at me, church elder. Who is it that you're sleeping with? Where have you come from before you come and lead us in the service? If you're working in an institution, how faithful are you with the resources of that institution? God desires that we serve him in an acceptable manner. And you know what? The grace of God have been revealed to us and it teaches us to live a sober and a godly life. We cannot mix things in the house of God and continue serving uh, the Lord. We need to be sober enough and separate ourselves from every evil because our God is not unrighteous and he will not accept services that have been done from people that have not cleansed themselves. When Ruth was going to see Boaz, Ru Naomi, the mentor, look at this girl and tell her, you know what, you must wash yourself. You must anoint yourself. You need to put on your best garment. Look at Ananiah and Sapphira in Acts chapter number 5. Do you know what? These people, they lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied to the man of God. I wish these days are back with us. You know, Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 4, while it remained before the property was sold, was it not thy own? And after it was sold, was it not thy own power? Or was it not at your own disposal? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but you have lied unto God. Look at this. The couple would still be alive if they had not given anything or if they had been honest that what they gave was just part of the proceeds of the sale. They would not have died. They were under no obligation at all to sell their property or even to give any amount from the sale to God. It was entirely up to Ananiah and Sapphira whether to give or not to give and how much or how little they should give. So they both agreed to give only a portion of the money and keep the rest for themselves. But unfortunately, both of them also agreed to tell the apostle that what they gave was all they had received from selling their property. Why did they have to do this? They probably wanted to give an impression that they were just as sacrificial and generous as some other members in the church or like Barnabas was. And you know what? It's a painful experience for this guy because this was a conspiracy to deceive the church into giving them more recognition and praise than they deserved. And don't we do these things, things that, you know, public relations in the church. There's a lot of public relations in the church. We want to show that this is who we are. This is what we've been able. Some people think they want to show this is my tithe. I've been able to give the whole tithe. But God knows the heart of the matter. God desires that we serve him acceptably. Look at what it costed Ananiah and Sapphira. Why? Because they wanted a perception that they are great givers so that they can get great attention in the same congregation. But wait a minute. It was the wrong days when the Holy Spirit will be able to deal with the people uh, directly. God desires that we serve him in purity. Are you a musician? Are you doing it out of purity? Uh, before you play that keyboard, how is your life? Pastor, 
How are you dealing with your wife? Because it is not the service. Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees, wouldn't you not have done the latter without forgetting the former? The two go together so that it can be an acceptable service. Then we also need to serve God in humility. Romans 12 and verse number 3, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For we, we, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are the body of Christ and individually members of another, having then gifts differently according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them according to the grace. Don't think yourself highly than that which God thinks about you. You know, let's serve in grace. Let's serve in humility. And as we serve in humility, we do not need to, to confuse our service versus our status. At times, our serving God gives us a status, give people an opportunity to look at us differently. But let's be reminded that God has called us to serve him in humility. I finish with this in uh, Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. We need to be humble as we serve God through the grace of God. As we serve God in, accept, in an acceptable manner, let's understand that we will give an account of everything that we do here on earth and even uh, in the kingdom that is to come. The grace of serving is the grace of serving spiritually from a transformed heart. Is the grace of serving sacrificially, you know, giving our devotions to the Lord and not doing it as a duty. Is the grace of serving sobering and serving according to our gifts because we have gifts according to the grace that God has given each one of us. And there is nothing that is greater than the other. It is the ability that God has accorded to each one of us. The grace of serving is the grace of serving cooperatively, working together, nourishing one another, uh, standing with one another, playing team, not competing in the house of God. It is the grace of serving sincerely. It is the grace of serving effectively. When you look at Galatians 2 from verse 9 up to 21, you will see how Paul and James and John are giving each other a hand of fellowship as each one of them serve in accordance to their calling in their own lives. If you're a singer, sing accordance to your grace. If you're the preacher, it doesn't make you greater than the one who is cleaning. It's just a grace. It's just an ability. Let's remain humble. Let's serve God and find grace to do it acceptably and with reverential fear because our God is a consuming God. May the Lord richly bless you. I am so blessed to have been able to minister to you. May God stir your heart. May the Lord stir your feet. May the Lord stir your hands. Arise. Let us serve God during this pandemic. Oh my goodness. If you're going to work, if you're going to the market, if you're eating in the morning and in, at lunchtime and in the evening, you can serve somebody. You can be of a blessing to somebody. Don't give up. Don't give up. It will be required of you at the judgment seat that you give an account of the time that God has given unto you. May the Lord richly bless you. I welcome you to like my Facebook page and my YouTube channel and God bless you. Bow down your heads and let's pray together. Father, I thank you. As I find grace and as my viewers find grace to keep on serving you, 
Lord, in this uncertain time, may you strengthen us, God. May you cause us to be that light, dear God, will shine in darkness. May we be that salt that will sweeten somebody's life, oh God. Lord, we pray that heavenly God, that you will help us, that in our pain, in our lack, in our challenges, Jehovah, that we can carry one another's burden. We give you thanks and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Uh, share the stream and we'll see you next Friday at the Minister's Lounge. Amen.